uh, you're still watching Gat Film Talks, and you can uh, uh, be part of these conversations on our social media platforms, sending your questions, your clarifications, your contributions to the discussions. We are honored to read them and also um, uh, flash them on the screen. Uh, let me let me come to you, Henry. Um, you, you've listened to Honorable uh, Ken Richams uh, presenting the state of political parties in Uganda. And uh, we've been having this discussion many times, whether do we have political parties or we have a resemblance of what we call political parties. You're going to comment on that, but also um, in terms of when you look at uh, the, the question around patriotism and nationalism, do we have Ugandans or do we have human beings occupying a territory called Uganda at 60 years? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Felix. And of course, uh, I was also still enjoying the good articulation of uh, Ken, John Ken, which I'm the man. Now, so I was reflecting, I want to reflect on those political parties, political parties at the onset. In 1958, when we first went to political parties, the literature says that there was a problem, uh, kind of a, a, a design flaw uh, in the way those political parties were constituted, because many of them, the concept that we, we inherited of political parties was that that was built on the context of, of, of the colonial master. No, I, you know, so the, 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 those political parties struggled uh, to fit into the context of Uganda. No wonder in 1958 they tell us, when you read the literature, that those political parties were, were, were elitist, but they were also something you can call weekend political parties. The founders and members of them used to convene around Katwe over the weekends because they were working class in order to, 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 to discuss and, and, and chat a way forward for these political parties. That ghost of political parties founded on a context that is alien to Uganda has continued to exist until today. That you have political parties that don't seem to be resonating with the, with the, with the interests, the aspirations of, of, of Ugandans. No wonder they look, you look around and ask who are your members and you don't get to see many of them. I have always made a reference to, there was a political party called Farmers Party. But a Farmers Party, and you ask whether there are any member farmers that are members of that party, and there isn't one. So how can you be Farmers Party, and none of the farmers around in a country uh, whose population, whose majority of the population are farmers, are not members of your party? You have a party that calls itself ecological party, but that party does not have any any uh, environment activists in it enlisted as members. And therefore, we have continued to struggle with these, these kinds of parties, parties that have not been grounded. And of course, the other thing you need to, to know is that uh, it, was, it has been the issue of, uh, of, uh, of uh, philosophy, but also the issue of, 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 uh, of uh, leadership of these political parties. Today, you have political parties that, who, have, uh, uh, who are weaker, than the, the individuals. The individuals in those parties are much stronger than the political parties themselves. Because today you'll find if you start from the biggest political party, I don't think that in, uh, the NRM, for example, which is the biggest party, has any sanctions in place, any systems in place that can sanction Mr. M7. Rather, they have to do what he says. Go to all the other political parties, big, big man syndrome and this of course has come back to to to, to what uh to, to 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 haunt us but and you cannot have democracy without political parties we have been told repeatedly and reminded uh, as such that political parties are the wheels on which democracy flows so if you have wheels that are punctured uh, in those kind of political parties we have, then the, you cannot have a, a steady movement of democracy. No wonder the democratization process of Uganda has not only uh, stagnated, it is now uh, 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 retrogressing. Moving to your question, you can also not have political democracy in place if you do not have citizens, a people that feel they belong to a territory. When you look at Ugandans today, you ask yourself, do we really have citizens that feel Ugandan 
or do we have human beings occupying a territory called Uganda? When you read, I was reading the book written by Professor Karujile, and there is where he says that at independence, the U people of Uganda felt and believed of themselves more as Banyankole, Baganda, you know, Langi, you know, Kakwas, or, or, or you know, Batoro, than they felt Ugandan. All the subsequent governments that have been in place, including this very one, have not done enough to make Ugandans feel Ugandan. This delusion of thinking that you can teach patriotism is, is, is something that can never fly. You see, so we don't we don't have people that that, that feel Uganda. No, no wonder if there is a, a government project being uh, uh, progressing, be it construction of a road, you will see that the citizens alongside that road are the ones that are aiding and abetting the workers on that road that are holding and siphoning cement, they're siphoning fuel, they they are helping them. And then when you say, yeah, what, why are you doing this? Is a, and they are saying this, that is government money. So it's a thing you cannot do in a country that has citizens. And when you don't have citizens, can you have independence? If you want independence, who is going to claim it? So we need Uganda, this territory called Uganda, to have Ugandans. At the moment, we don't seem to have many Ugandans, which is why they are able to let uh, many wrong things go, which is why... Uh, like I said at the onset, at the start, every time we have had to change government uh, and using uh, uh, military force, we have had to be helped by external forces. I will not be surprised if it is still the case this time around. So I think uh, we need to be intentional and deliberate on ensuring that we make these people call you. I ask you a question. We have a constitution, for example, from 1995 to date, that constitution has remained in one language called English. But isn't there anybody that does not know that the people of the Ugandans that speak English are less than 30 percent? What is stopping the country from publishing that constitution in the different local languages so that people can understand it and identify with it? But they cannot, they don't want to do it because I think there is something that has to be gained from leading a people that don't feel that they're citizens of that country because then there are certain things they will not they will not do they, they, there cannot be a social movement in a in a territory where people do not feel like they are, they are citizens where they, they are not spurred by that citizenship feeling the feeling of ownership of the country that this is a country i should die for i think these are some of the things that uh, that uh, that are bedeviling uh, the, the democratization of this country. Back to you, Felix. Thank you so much, Henry. And, and comments are starting to come in. Uh, let me first read the comment of uh, Farida Lule, who says that one of the solutions to this monster um, uh, of the current electoral crisis is to reduce the salary of politicians. And I'm going to come to that as well, because there's a question around, I'll tie it with the question around corruption. But also there's a question from... Uh, from Abel. Abel is looking at the fact that the military has had a huge impact on Uganda's political history ever since the 1966 attack on Lubiri. And, and whether it's possible, can we have democracy when the military is at the center of our body politic? Um, that question, I, I, will, I will ask each one of you to make a conclusion on that question. But before you come into that question, um, not to lose Friday Ray's argument. The, 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 uh, the last 60 years, um, I've also seen the monster called corruption uh, born, groomed, fed, and now is fat, that monster called corruption. So if, when you look at the corruption levels, are we more corrupt as a country than we were 60 years ago? If, if a 60-year-old if we use the if we use the metaphor that Uganda is a sixty year old, should we say that Uganda is a sixty year old greedy man? And and honorable, paint us a picture. If this was a monster, corruption, what is in the belly of this sixty year old beast? What has been stolen up to this point? In fact, thank you very much for posing that question. 
one of the reasons why President Museveni's government may not have any clear future in its existence is in regard to the way it has handled economic affairs. It is a tragedy to hear that countries like Kenya now have their Kenya Commercial Bank opening branches around the East African region. And they look at the history of Uganda Commercial Bank. Uganda Commercial Bank in the sixth parliament where I was, or the members of parliament unanimously discouraged the disposal or the sale of Uganda Commercial Bank. President Museven and the lady Mutebiri went in darker corners and disposed of that bank. The disappointment of many people in this country. It is a tragedy, it is absurd for Ugandans now to bank the taxpayers' money in foreign-owned banks. Does that breed independence? It is, it is chaotic to hear permanent secretaries banking the money is collected from the people in Stambik. Uh, can you imagine? It is absurd. I will, to encourage people to bank in circles. After a whole 60 years of independence, we do not trust any mechanics of an operating bank engineered by Ugandan people. It is absurd. As if that was not enough. We are going where we are, and we are still stagnant because constitutional rule has died down. There is no constitutional governance in Uganda. Otherwise, under Article 208 of the Constitution, we are forbidden from making operational military men government officers. Many people in government, in President Museveni's government, are serving uh, in the army while they are also ministers. That is unconstitutional. For example, we have you talked about the military. We have had since 1996, we have had 10 members of the military in parliament doing what? The provision in that constitution on, on such a group was supposed to be revised every after 10 years. We have never revised that provision. Workers, women MPs, uh, military, we have never revised it because the atmosphere is not tenable. The atmosphere we are talking about, and I think Henry has elaborated it, does not create any space for matters of public concern to be publicly discussed. This is a military junta ruling us. And I would like to appeal to the religious people. You religious people, you are keeping quiet when your lives are in danger. The time is now for you to talk out, provided you talk, you know, legally, you talk without abusing anybody but talk out the facts which can be known so that the people of Uganda start waking up. Otherwise, sooner or later, this government is going to fall overnight. For example, as we speak now, they are telling you that uh, our date, burden, international date, including the national date, they are saying it is 50, 53% is the GDP. Who tells you that? It is now climbing to 57 because far from the area of borrowing which is entitled to Uganda under the law of sovereignty, even Somalia can borrow from the World Bank under the cover of sovereignty because it is a sovereign nation. But we have passed in that. That is why recently when we had to borrow again from the Chinese, we had to mortgage Uganda, Uganda airport at Entebbe for them to give us 200 million dollars. The country is in danger. This year's budget alone, this year's budget reads really 48 trillion. 46% of that money must be paid in debts. Can you imagine a country 
with such immense problems, managing to employ 83 ministers to do what when Kenya's government and the Kenya's economy, so big as it is, has only 21 ministers? Where is Uganda going? You people in government, why don't you one day all collectively resign as ministers to demonstrate to our president Museveni that there is danger? I have called, I've used the word our president Museveni because I have mercy. I have mercy in President Museveni's government. It is different from Idi Amin. If it is different from Idi Amin, what it does is should also distinguish it from Idi Amin's deeds. Otherwise, I see a big problem. Uh, Henry talked about the public, the pol political parties. Political parties, a democracy these days without political parties cannot be a democracy. In Uganda, for as long as the political parties cannot stay public meetings, then we have no political parties. Why is it that in parliament we have so many independent members of parliament? These are frustrated people after the primary elections in their respective political parties. Because under a functional political party system, the conservative party which I lead can easily support a, an able-bodied person from Bukoma Simi, judging from the day-to-day -day performance of those people in their respective entities. But now, for political parties are a forbidden deed. The moment you assemble politically, you are in trouble. See how many people NUP has lost because of public attempting to gather publicly and give support to Bob White. Something must be done. We cannot continue in existence under this dark cover. Otherwise, we burst, we explode. And I'm not saying you must explode, but see how you explode, provided you explode substantially. Uh, I, I see a problem right now. I was surprised recently when Parliament started discussing the resolution of the European Parliament. That resolution was supposed to be discussed through the pioneer introduction of a government official in Parliament, either the Prime Minister or the Vice President of Uganda. It should not have been a Speaker of Parliament because a Speaker is a judge, he's an innocent person who is supposed to moderate discussion instead of introducing a policy or a bill or a resolution. So I would like to advise as an environmentalist that first of all, I am surprised that President Yoe Kaguta Seven has gone to that extent of condemning the European Union. The European Union is one of our ardent supporters, especially in the periodic balancing of our budget. They are always with us. Why are we discouraging the interaction of the Uganda government with the Chinese. The Chinese have never been helpful to us in balancing our budget. And as if that was not enough, see the danger and the havoc they have caused in Uganda environmentally. They are the biggest emitters and the destroyers of our wetlands. President Yoli Kabutam Seven, you are talking large about idle electricity. But if you don't protect the forests, if you don't protect the wetlands, how will you maintain a status quo of continuous electric supply when the, when the, water, the waterfalls are weakening day after day? I begin laughing when I hear stories about Bijagat spoken by government officers. At one time, John Ken Chams was condemned for having discouraged the initial establishment of the dam. I did so because they were inflating the figure which would be a punishment to ourselves and the next generation in terms of tax payment. Right now, there is a funny occurrence over that dam. Aga Khan invested $20 million billion. Uganda invested $10 billion. Aga Khan has started getting the dividends to the tune of 650 
million dollars Uganda has never received any dividend since that dam started working. But as, as if that was not enough, I would like to, to encourage Parliament to reduce the speed at which it is moving when talking about the resolution of the European Union. The European Union is not stopping, stopping the, the construction of the pipeline. It is advising the government of Uganda, Total, Tanzania, to check the, 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 the ground on matters related to the summary eviction of people affected by the pipeline, checking the freedom of the workers and the, the NGOs related to energy, the way they are treated, and also to check the the environmental impact assessment quality standards. Most of the environment related uh, reports on what is going to be done are the lukewarm reports generated by NEMA without any explanation. For example, over 300 oil wheels, wells, over 300 oil wells will be done in Maxwell Falls National Park. Maxwell Falls National Park, I talked about it in my poem, is one of the most outstanding waterfalls in Africa. It is a beauty. It is something that must be protected for this generation and the generation to come. Oil will expire, but tourism is not supposed to expire for as long as Uganda continues to live. Now, finally, on this particular point, the European Union was advising Uganda to check itself before it goes ahead, Uganda goes ahead to explore the resources of the, the pipeline. Why? Because there are already big mistakes around the communities of Tiranga and the Kingfisher. Over 7,000 people have been evicted, many of them from Changwari. Many of them are in, in, in camps. They are sleeping in camps as refugees within Uganda. They have not been paid. The, the houses promised to be constructed have never been constructed. So how can you go ahead with the project when things are still in shambles? Something must be done. Lastly, uh, Uganda is, uh, is, uh, is one of the most indebted countries in the world. She, Total has no money to boost what is going to be done. She must borrow from either the World Bank or the European Development Fund. And in France, France is a member of the European Union. And Total is a, is a parastatal body within France. So that money cannot be advanced because it is very big money until certain conditions regarding the environment have been cleared. Finally, very finally, the Albertine Graben, where oil production is going to be concentrated, is also the area that harbors and they make it, uh, wildlife resources without which we can not promote tourism. What guarantee do we have that after destroying Bogoma forest reserve uh, and the vegetation all around the Albertine gravel, agricultural practice will go on team. What guarantee do you have that the wildlife in those areas, most of which are endemic, will not run away to Rwanda and the Congo, respectively, to leave Uganda in environmental shambles? Thank you so much, Honorable. Uh, very many issues you raised. The date, um, the, uh, the EU, um, the EU question, uh, which has been uh, making rounds in the media as well. Um, Henry, picking from the date, um, there's that question around um, if you had paint a picture of the beast called Uganda, what do you find in that belly of that beast in terms of corruption? No wonder we are in such a huge public debt. You know, the whole problem of syndicated corruption that has become, become a phenomenon that has matured during the last 20 years of the current regime. 
is something you cannot uh, you, you cannot miss when you're trying to characterize this human this country of 60 this 60 year old uh country called uganda every year the men and women that have been stealing and looting on industrial scale continue uh, to grow in greed and i'm happy you talked you, you referred to you referred to them as a beast because if it was a human being at my age i eat less than i used to eat 20 years back but this beast has a belly that grows in size the the older it grows the bigger the belly that it has this greed that you cannot imagine greed of 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 of, of gigantic proportions that 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 the, the, the money uh, on the book and was talking about on paper uh you you hear that uh, the residents of those uh, areas uh, that are going to be that have, have been displaced have been compensated in reality one of the of the, the of these beasts has taken the money away we used to to sing about uh and that's a Uganda thing but you see this beast the corruption that and impunity the impunity that has come to characterize uh, the current uh, state uh, of affairs in Uganda where people steal and loot with ease and they get away with everything and sometimes they even look untouchable to the extent that many of them have now uh, appeared to be placing the rule of law upon their whims and caprices is something that uh, that, 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 that 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 cannot help but but, but, but decry so i until for, for for this 60 year old until we have a turning point what explains why the roads of uganda are the most expensive in the region why what explains these things we are also told that in this kind of part of the world, you cannot you 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 cannot operate successfully a business of of over fifty billion without having the blessing of 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 the regime or one of the cronies of the regime. So these are things that that that, 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 that have been bedeviling this, and one of the reasons why politics today is so monetized is because uh uganda has become a playground for looters uh just before i came to this show i was having an interaction with one of the members of parliament the name was held i will not say but he was telling me that in parliament there is a group of mps that are aged 40 and below they have a group they call the voice and that one of the agendas they were, they were discussing is that what if they they broke away from the nrm and formed a party called Money for Democratic Change. So be, because the reason they are there is money now. So, so that it's clear to the, to the voters that what brought us here is money. So why not form this party called Money for Democratic Change? So these are things you have come to see. And you cannot, you cannot have democracy when you have leaders in, in, in political office today thinking about money for forming a party uh for, for purposes of, of extracting money and therefore these are decryable these are these are these are not these are tragedies it's a tragedy uh, it's a time and a clarion call we have to make or a clarion call on all ugandans all people occupying this territory called uganda that have to be reminded that you are ugandan to understand that this is uganda there's a country called uganda if you live in it you are born here your, your grandparents were born here you are ugandan and as a ugandan there are things you have to do you cannot be bystanders to the looting that is happening and you're doing nothing you cannot be uh playing part you cannot allow to uh, to, to, to 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 aid and abet the practices that are raping and bastardizing the democratic progression of your country so i think these are some of the, the this is come some of the of, 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 of my parting shots and it's been a pleasure and an honor uh to interact on the same platform with my senior john kenry charms the man god bless you thank you so much henry uh, i'm also bringing this to uh, uh honorable just one question as as a parting shot as well from your end um are uganda's problems democratic are uganda's democratic problems inherited acquired 
all induced. And and as you as you wrap up, can we have a democracy when you have the military at the center of our politics? In your parting shots. As if that was not enough. Corruption, which you posed a question over recently, right just now, is government embedded. It is rooted, it is grown within government. For example, the biggest chunk of land in Kyangwari, Bunyoro, was acquired, ownership was acquired over that land in advance by government ministers. So that they, they tap very big money in compensation. That is one. The contracts of oil. In law, when you talk about a contract or an agreement, but particularly the contract, the contract carries, must carry a consideration. And consideration means money. You cannot come into contract without guarantee, some guarantee that will fulfill that contract. And uh, those contracts are not nudum pactu. They don't, they don't go without a consideration. Many people have been complaining over what is likely to happen, what has happened to the big monies the companies initially paid the Uganda government after the discovery of oil from 2006 to date. Some of those contracts are about the service order, service providing provision. And we like it to have a war, another war of nations who have invested, whose companies have invested in oil, only to be disappointed when harvesting of oil begins. That is one big problem. It is said that over a billion shillings has already been withdrawn from the petroleum fund. And they are trying to deceive Ugandans that it was used in the budgets. But in most of those budgets we have already received, no mention has ever been made that this money we want to find is, is going to be drawn from the oil fund. That is corruption. Uh, one of the reasons why we are making noise, a whole minister in the names of Saida Bumba, former minister of finance, openly lamented in the recent past and said the I signed some oil, oil company contracts without knowing what was the content. With reference to what has been happening in Mozambique, where Total has been forced to cancel, to call off the oil project, project. will it be surprising if Total is equally forced to call off the project in Uganda because of the consequential problems which have not been cleared. All these are the issues. So what is the way forward in my view? The way forward is President Yori Kabutam Seven, our president, should stop provoking those companies or those parliaments. They are friendly people you come back on the round table and establish how you are going to deal with the consequences of what has been presented on table instead of castigating those countries because as we speak if you are spending 46 percent of your budget on debts you are bad enough not to be given loans even international loans and that is an issue secondly the problem of governance in Uganda is still a huge problem. Most of the government organs are in shambles and they depend on patronage, masterminded by the chief of the junta. Something must be done to clear the dust about the messed up governance system in Uganda. Because if they begin harvesting oil when the, 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 the order of governance is bad as it is. What guarantee do you give us that it will not prolong the dictatorship to make Uganda govern like Hitler did or Stalin? 
So something must be done to make sure that governance is clear, it is improved. You must create space for political parties, the governance, the, I mean political parties, which are the governed, the vanguard of governance. They must be in action. We must not be silent for anything to be done meaningfully in this country. Something must be done. Otherwise, I find it difficult to believe that Uganda will go ahead with the harvesting of oil under the current mess, if not checked in advance. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, I want to bring this to a close. And uh, Henry, finally, and this is finally, um, are Uganda's democratic problems inherited, given what Honorable say, are they acquired or they are induced? Thank you very much. You know, most of the problems uh, we have are actually acquired and induced. They're not inherited. There is nowhere you can say that you're not able to, to, to run meaningful democracy. The problem is that uh, we have decided to go return to multi-party in 2005. And the thing that the, 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 the phenomena called NRM, that is a military junta, as, as, as uh, my senior uh, brother has said, uh, is doing, uh, um, um, uh, is doing uh, that, that junta that came, uh, and we know it's a military establishment in 2005, they were not sincere enough to tell us that for them, they never believed in political parties. Then they enveloped themselves in something called a party. So we keep having a military establishment uh, in place, calling itself a party. And, and so they have gone and, 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 uh, to the supermarket and purchased something called uh, democracy, multi-party democracy, brought it here, but they're only applying it in part. It's like you can say, I eat pork, but I eat only the legs. I don't eat the tail. What is this? I don't eat the trunk. If you have gone and, and procured multipartism, then exercise multiparty in uh, multipartism in its entirety. Among the things that we want to see, that political parties are allowed to freely converse and, and, and mobilize the citizenry. Okay? We would like to see a free media. Because you see, we have said often that the information is the oxygen of democracy. And this information is provided by the media because the people, the citizens, the electors cannot be everywhere. So the, 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 it's the media that is supposed to be picking up this information. But if you are going to beat up, brutalize, and bastardize journalists who are covering opposition political party activities, then you cannot talk about democracy. Democracy requires that there is free competition. Okay, if you have decided and written a law, and in that law you have provided in 14C, uh, in Article 14B, that uh, for the, uh, uh, in respect of elections, political parties must receive public funds on equal basis. There is no way you're going to ignore that because it is the command of the law. The, the spirit of that, uh, you know, provision, uh, that section, was to make sure that there is a semblance of competition you cannot continue using the military. And in, I agree with you, uh, uh, John Ken, uh, Honorable Richards, that I think the time has come for us, uh, Ugandans, to have a colloquy, or if you like, a serious conversation on the role of the military in our politics. Because that has not been defined. And so they, they keep interfering. And they think that it's their right to, to, you know, to, inter, you know, to determine the political direction of this country. No wonder you have generals that are pronouncing themselves the tweets, the so-called tweets that have raised, the, that have ruffled the feathers across borders, notwithstanding. And so I think these are some of the serious questions we have to find answers to. And we cannot have democracy without citizens. You know, the citizens must assemble. But in a situation where all the, the physical spaces of assembly were taken, you remember at the time of independence, every region had a, 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 a place for, gather, for assembling. There were bomber grounds everywhere across all the districts. Today, if you go to those bomber grounds, you will find a deployment, either a member there and so on. They've been fenced off. People cannot assemble, come to Uganda. 
The constitutional square is a no-go area. That's supposed to be a public park. All these have been removed. So how will you exp you know, enjoy your freedom of assembly? So these are some of the things we have to look at. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, all is not lost. I think uh, um, um, uh, as long as we have citizens that are ready and willing to keep pushing, I think we will get there. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And that brings us to a close. Uganda at 60 were reflecting on the state of electoral democracy. And with me, I had um, Honorable John Ken Chamsi, uh, who is a politician, a lawyer, and the leader of the Conservative Party, served in the seventh parliament, also in the ninth parliament. And I also with me, I heard Henry Muguz, who is an electoral democracy expert and the executive director of Alliance for Finance Monitoring. And we were discussing, reflecting on the state of electoral democracy, your host, Felix Kafuma. Um, and allow me to sign it out from here till next week. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the celebrations on the 9th of October when we come of age. Bye-bye. Stay blessed. <laughs>